Welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, where our job is to help you build visibility, professional credibility, and connection with your ideal client by putting the human at the center of innovative marketing so you can build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship with your ideal clients. I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm honored that you're here with me. If you haven't joined our wonderful marketing transformation community yet, go to innovabiz.co and collect your free gift as well. Do subscribe to the show and also leave a review because it helps others find us. Let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. We have to bring back the human part of being working together as anthropologists, psychologists, psycholinguistics have described at the very core of our management methods, which are great. However, it's not sufficient to say a leader must be a great communicator. That's not enough. Communication is not like just one process among 15, like procurement or marketing. No. Communication is the process to put things in common that enables all the others. So when you're good at that, especially to me, these two requirements that are trust and clarity, mutual clarity, then you start the magic happening. Welcome back. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. If you haven't yet listened to my recent conversations with creator of the Employee to Entrepreneur System, Louisa Joe, and with Human Performance Improvement Strategist, John Christian Jervet, then do go check them out, but only after you've listened to today's conversation. Today, I'm really excited to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest, Stefano Mastrogiacomo. He's a team tools designer, a project management consultant, and a professor. He has a passion for human coordination, and he's the the designer of the team alignment map, the team contract, the fact finder, and the other tools presented in his new book, High Impact Tools for Teams. He's been leading digital projects and advising project teams in international organizations for more than 20 years while teaching and doing research at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. His interdisciplinary work is anchored in project management, in change management, psycholinguistics, evolutionary anthropology and design thinking. In our discussion today, Stefano talked to me about how to use his team alignment map for vision alignment, for planning, for project management, for distributed teams coordination and effective team meetings. He explained the background of psycholinguistics and human behavior reasons why these tools work and how to best use them. And I love his cell metaphor, we emerge from the small. Without further ado, then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Stefano Mastrogiacomo. Hi, I'm your host, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm really excited today to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast from Geneva in Switzerland, Stefano Mastrogiacomo, and he is project management professor. He's a team tools designer, and he's also author of the new book, High Impact Tools for Teams. Welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, Stefano. It's a great privilege to have you as my guest. Thank you, Jürgen, and hello to all our listeners. It's a honor to be here. Alex Osterwalder, who was our guest on episode 293 of the InnovaBuzz podcast, he's your co-author of the book, High Impact Tools for Teams, and he connected us in in many ways. So big hello to Alex. Hello, Alex. Uh, <laughs> we're going to now, play this interview. <laughs> and everybody at the Strategizer team. 
<laughs> yes, hello to all the people at, at Strategizer. I love all the books and um, I've just added the high impact tools to my collection. Now, Stefano, you're fascinated by the human coordination and, and how people work together. Um, is That's one of the things you said in your profile. How did you come up with these tools and, and what prompted you to kind of put these things together? Well, if you launch me on the topic of coordination, human coordination, <laughs> the conversation is going to be very long because it's a fascinating topic. Uh, I'll try, I'll do my best to stop me, Jürgen, um, uh, if I'm too long on that. Um, I, uh, I was studying at the University of Lausanne and uh, in, in the management school, and that's where, um, in the course of my studies, I had to develop some uh, materials for uh, uh, reports, and uh, I entered into this topic of uh, project management methods, work methodologies, and uh, got really fascinated by the process side of work. Step one, step two, step three. And at the time, um, there was a center at the MIT called the Center for Coordination Science, which was developing a handbook called the Business Process Handbook, where they were sort of creating an inventory of all the business processes you need to run a company. Um, their center was called the Center for Coordination Science. And um, I remember that I became immediately fascinated by their work. And that's where my journey in human coordination began. This was a long time ago. It was about maybe 25 <laughs> years ago. At the time, you know, of business process reengineering, uh, it was very popular, zero, zero paper-based office. So it, it's a long time ago. However, for years, I've been trying to analyze, to develop an analytical engineering-based view of coordination at work, mainly through processes. And I got stuck. <laughs> After a while, I got stuck because you never end describing what's happening in terms of steps. And, what, and, and then you, have, you, you, you find yourself confronted with the problem of granularity. Uh, up to what level you, you describe, like uh, a business process. Uh, and after a while, I came to discover that other disciplines than management uh, were analyzing the process of coordination. By the way, coordination, if you look at the definition, means the harmonious functioning of parts, of individual mm. parts. Mm. And boom, I discovered psycholinguistics and my life changed. <laughs> uh, psycholinguistics is not a discipline that is very common in a management school or, or uh, in IT departments. However, psycholinguistics is the branch of linguistics that analyzes uh, how we use language to do things in certain contexts. So they're not interested in the grammar or the rules of construction or the syntax or the etymology. No, 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 no. It's just language use. And when I discovered how, in particular, the work of Herbert Clark, a psycholinguist at Stanford, how he explained human coordination and not engineering-based, process-based coordination, it sort of changed completely my view on the phenomenon of working together and also on what efficiency means. Now, the point of Herbert Clark uh, uh, that kept my mind busy for the last 15 years is that um, human coordination is based on language use. And um, the device we use to coordinate as humans is communication. Communication has Latin roots. That means to put in common. And it's a matter of creating so-called common ground or as a synonym, mutual understanding. Because when we mutually understand each other, then 
we can start predicting first dividing labor among us. I know what you will do, you know what I will do. And we mm. start also because we have that common knowledge predicting accurately what the other person will be doing for the joint activity and adapt our actions so that when we meet next time, what I have been doing has been done considering what you are doing because I know it. Mm. And so on. So that's the uh, fascinating journey. The, this was very different from a process-based step one, step two, step three yeah, yeah. Uh, view of coordination. And then coordination is viewed by psycholinguists as a series of linguistic mechanisms to solve problems together. Hmm. And yeah, then they integrate. Yeah, hmm. sorry. Uh, yeah, I told you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what they can continue until tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. What What I really like because you know you've touched on a lot there. What What really struck me in looking in reading through the book and looking at the different tools was particularly the, the section that that is at the back of the book where you go into quite a bit of detail on on why these tools work. So so we'll go into the tools in a moment because the tools yep. essentially are kind of a, a series of visual maps that um, help align teams and get teams working together. It's kind uh, of a the, checklist, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and as you pointed out, a lot of that comes from the business process thinking of, you know, here's what everybody does and this this is the checklist to keep you on track and keep you doing the right things so that we're all on the same page. That's a really good metaphor for this because because most of the tools are a, a kind of a one-page map. The uh, But the thing that I really like and, and, you know, you've delved into this and I'd love to explore that some more is is the concept of why, why this actually works as a tool. It's not just that analytical tool, is it? So... Maybe you could start yeah. by the the team alignment map is probably the core tool. Maybe you could start by outlining that and then giving us a bit of a description of, of why that works in the context of this um, um, psycho, well, what did you call it? Language psych psychology. Yeah, psycholinguistics. Psycholinguistics, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> linguistics. yeah. Okay, so where do the tools come from? Um, while I I was... Uh, reinterpreting all my notions of coordination using the psycholinguistics lens, I was leading digital projects in large organizations. Mm. And um, I was very aware of the uh, methodologies available for that, and I was applying them. But I also realized that there was a sort of disconnect between um, what... Uh, the, the key principles of you, human communi co communication and what I was practicing every day. And bit by bit, <laughs> piecemeal, <laughs> I start interpreting these principles coming from another discipline and developing tools for my own practice that would complement the beautiful methods I was using. Hmm. The first tool that came to my mind uh, actually was not and um, that I started developing is not the team alignment map, but I'll be back to the team alignment map in a second, is the fact finder, a tool that helps ask good questions. Uh, but uh, maybe we will discuss about that later. But after, after uh, uh, a little time, I developed that uh, team alignment map. Now, the team alignment map took quite some time to develop, and the whole idea is this. I've been writing an important number of project descriptions, project charters to get the validation from management and the resources I needed to run my projects. Um, and I've always felt that um, some, some recurring patterns happening in decision meetings. The recurring pattern is this, that you have been working for months on your thing and you're, you're super maybe competent on what you're doing and so on. That's what I wish for everybody. However, I've noticed that sometimes people say yes or no, but their body language <laughs> really illustrates 
<laughs> there is a disconnect between what they say and the body language. Uh, the body language really expressed misunderstanding or uh, when, is going this, when, when is this meeting going to end <laughs> because mm -hmm. I have other stuff in my mind. And I knew that this was not good. Because of these psycholinguistics principles, uh, this idea of common ground is mutual understanding until I have evidence that you understand me, uh, we won't be able to coordinate effectively. So um, I came up with this idea of creating a structured uh, poster that could be a kind of plugin anywhere um, that sort of forces that mutual understanding a little bit. So what, what we presuppose others will do in projects uh, what um, we presuppose are the resources available, all these things, let's make them explicit. And the thing is, if you do an analysis, an entity analysis of every item you find in project management books, you end up like with almost 200 variables, so going from <laughs> critical success factors to objectives to resources. and. Um, it took quite some time to boil down these 200 variables into just four. So it's, it's been a huge reduction mechanism. What, what, is, what is really the core of the things we must discuss together as a team and seek evidence of understanding quickly in 30 minutes? Just that. Just at least make sure that these four requirements are met and then we can move on. And that's what the team alignment map does. It creates super fast, instant alignment on key elements that enable us to work together effectively in the future. So these four elements, yeah, it's like four plus one. And I'll start with the plus one. The plus one is it's the overall challenge or the mission. Mm. Uh, I mean, why are we in this room together? <laughs> why, you know, so give, give meaning to our presence. And so we start with a brief description of the mission and sometimes some level of chaos already starts there. So, <laughs> uh, so, and that shows misalignment about the mission. That's fine. That's what the poster does. And so the idea is that all the key stakeholders of uh, the future project, activity, et cetera, are together online or in the same room. And we have that brief conversation to make sure we understand each other on what we are accepting. Uh, to do together. So once the mission is agreed and understood by everybody, we move on to four columns. Um, the first column, obvious, but what is not so obvious is that we all must mutually agree on that, is joint objective. What do we intend to achieve together? And now these can be described in many different forms, out, outcomes, deliverables, activities, things to do in the future, its intentions. So we describe these together, High level, very high level. Um, and then we move to the second column. The second column um, is joint commitments. That means if we are in this room together, it's because I cannot achieve all these goals together. So what are you going to do and what am I going to do here? What will I do for you? What will you do for me? And this is almost of a negotiation part where we must mutually agree and make it explicit who is, going, who is doing what for whom. <laughs> Not just in English, going doing what in general. And you see, it's very basic common sense. And as I continue through the columns, what that does is just insist on non not neglecting the basics. That's what this poster does. And then we move to the third column. Um, all human activities use resources, all of them. Now, in this interview, we're using electricity, time, uh, and so on. So... Um, we have to discuss on what we need together and agree on what are the resources that we need that are available, what are the resources that we need that are not available, and discuss if that is feasible. And, uh, and, 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 and the way the resource discussion takes place is, what do I need to do my part? And let's, let's make sure everyone understands what I need. And then we move to the last column, we all, I guess, we're all familiar with the notion of risks. Risks are uh, unexpected events 
that might prevent us from succeeding. Um, and um, a great KPI for risks is to listen to your internal fears. <laughs> and that's where I'm connecting also the human part of it. And that's what the poster suggests. Let's have a discussion about our fears, list them. And when you complete the four columns plus the mission together, you have a big picture of the collaboration ahead between us. And because we've been engaged collectively in the conversation, uh, that is a great uh, trigger of mutual understanding uh, uh, from a psycholinguistic uh, uh, perspective. And that is what triggers collective power <laughs> when mm. we mutually understand each other. So now everyone is in a position where, okay, I see the big picture. Uh, I understand how I fit in the big picture because I've been part of the conversation. And before we conclude this alignment meeting, whatever other tool we use, huh, this is just a plugin that works with any method. Uh, there is one last thing we must do. Um, to, to, to complete the columns from left to right, is called the forward pass. The forward pass creates the big picture of the collaboration. Then we have, before we leave the room, if we want to increase our chances of success, we must take care of the last two columns. The last two columns are joint resources and joint risks. So in joint resources, if some resources are missing, it's a problem. Yeah. It right. means that some members won't be able to do their part because they miss these resources. And in the joint risks uh, column, if there are some important risks visible, something must be done to mitigate these risks because if they happen, I don't wish to anybody that risks happen, but if they happen, they may completely stop the project. So the idea is before we conclude the team alignment map meeting session to make sure we're on the same page, uh, we must address the problematic post-it post post notes on the last two columns. And how you do this is that you take a risk. For example, one risk could be, one risk could be uh, clients are not available for interviews. Well, you have to transform in the backward pass that post-it note, you remove it from the risk column and transform it into a new objective with a new commitment. Hmm. So, a uh, client is not available for interviews, you remove it, and then you transform it with schedule client interviews ahead, and maybe with more people. And Jurgen, you commit for doing that, for example, and you say you will do yeah. that by that day. So, we've done together a live, live risk mitigation, and working with uh, people in risk management, what the kind of feedback I, I get from them is that this makes risk management fun. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if you've filled a risk mitigation matrix. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes in a yeah, team, it's, you it's, know, with a big Excel spreadsheet yeah. file on the room. Well, it's not, I mean, it's super useful uh, and I'm not questioning right. that. But I mean, it's not necessarily the most engaging exercise in the world. Whereas yeah, there is a real sense the body of language relief. before, <laughs> and, and that's, exactly. that's the sort of meeting where you see that body language. <laughs> yeah, so that has been a long explanation. But basically, at the end of this exercise, we increase the potential of uh, delivering and contribution. We, we, cre we create the conditions for every, every member to contribute the most, in the most possible effective way to the success of the project because mm. I understand objectives, I know what I'm doing and what other people are doing. Uh, I, I, I know I have the resources I need and my fears and risks I had identified, uh, I know they're being taken care of. That is uh, quite, uh, quite good when you enter into a new project. Yeah, yeah. And it, I mean, it, it's stunningly simple on the one hand and yet so powerful. And what also struck me and what I was really impressed with that it was useful in so many different scenarios. So you've kind of gone through how you might apply it in a, a project management situation, but you could do it in, in um, you know, how are we going to work together? How, what's this, what's our team culture look like, for example, or what's, what's the vision for our company or, um, 
distributed teams what's the role of people in distributed teams because this is um, something that's very current of course with the um, we're still in the midst of this pandemic and we still have lots of remote work going on that that kind of took a lot of people by surprise and so there was this challenge around how do you work with distributed teams and I see this as a really powerful tool in that and even just to manage a team meeting um, it's it's simple enough to do something with a simple team meeting and yet so powerful. Precisely. The need for alignment, I believe, is greater now. It, it was important before, but it's even greater now that we have to work over distance. So the technologies we're using today, uh, I couldn't have dreamt of better technology in the past. Honestly, it's amazing where, if you know where we come from in terms of uh, mm. uh, collaboration tools. Um, however, if you Google media richness theory, or if you, again, you, you go and have a look at uh, the psycholinguistic analysis of uh, communication channels, uh, what's the most effective communication channel for humans? I'll let the audience think for a second. <laughs> the most effective technology in the world for creating common ground between humans, well, that is conversation, face-to-face -face dialogue. Mm. And it's proven and measured. Second comes video conferencing. Then we have audio conferencing. And you see the, the top three is synchronous communication. And then we start with email, chat, SMS, and all the rest. And, and, and at the very end, you have some sort of spam or posters in the street. <laughs> uh, now, as we lost, it's true, for a limited period, probably, but we lost our most effective uh, communication technology, we have to move to the second one. But the bandwidth, <laughs> of the second one is not as effective of the first one. So the, the need to focus and prepare our online conversation and align effectively, I, be, I believe, is greater, especially if we engage into a joint activity, into a project. So that's where these tools beautifully, because they're visual, integrate on digital whiteboards and other things. And the whole idea is not, nothing is very new in what I'm saying in terms of content. But in terms of process, it's different. It's different. The, the, the key outcome here is, yes, you've been addressing these topics in the past, um, but now really consider doing that collectively. Co-plan, co-validate understanding. Because what that's, again, where the collective power comes from. Uh, accountability comes from participation. So. Um, what these posters do, and there are two of them presented in the book, is really guide that type of conversation, in, in, I believe, in a very effective way, uh, given the feedbacks I receive from real teams. Hmm. Yeah, I love it. And you've talked quite a lot about mutual understanding and how you generate mutual understanding and how important conversation is, and then describe the team alignment management uh, the team alignment map as a, a management tool to help with with that whole process. You mentioned earlier that Fact Finder was the first tool you you came across and developed. So tell us a little bit more about Fact Finder because I'm I'm curious about that one. It's it's kind of one that starts off with really good questions to kind of challenge what we might sort of assume and what what might not be said in in those conversations? Well, the fact finder um, is a revisited tool of a tool that revisited another <laughs> framework. <laughs> <laughs> However, this is, uh, this is how it works. The, 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 the roots of the fact finder are in uh, um, NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, uh, which is a great uh, body of knowledge uh, on how to ask uh, really good questions. By good question is, I mean, questions that reduce perception gaps and that help people stay anchored in reality. 
Mm. And the fact finder basically is a tool that is built, it's a circle with <laughs> that is the focus area. And then you have all the other part of the tool around it that uh, is the zone that is out of focus. So when we are in the center, we are in the reality zone. When we are outside, we are in our heads. Yeah. Um, and the whole idea is how do I recenter a conversation when I feel lost in the conversation, and that happens to all of us, in a very diplomatic and um, uh, effective way. For that, uh, so the fact finder is not a poster where a team works together. This is a, a behavioral tool, something you have in your notepad or you put in your pocket, mm. it's for you. Uh, and it's one of these tools I introduced for psychological safety and to become a more competent team member. Um, the idea is simple. To, to become very effective at asking good questions, you have to understand one difference and five traps. Uh, I'll go very, very quickly on that. But the whole idea is that um, psychologists describe reality in two terms. First order reality, which is anything that I can measure with my five senses. So first order reality is what we usually describe as facts. And then there is second order reality that is all the interpretations, judgments, hypotheses we infer from things we have seen in the first order reality. So first order measurable, second order, it's all the thinking going on in our heads. Now there are as many second order realities as there are people on earth <laughs> because we all have different sense making mechanisms. So the whole idea is when we um, really need to engage collectively and effectively on something, just make sure we are on the same reality and we don't stay in our, you know, in our heads uh, uh, with all our ruminations and thinking going around. And there are five traps in which ev ev all of us fall. And uh, these traps are uh, uh, judgments, hypotheses. I don't want to develop too much of that right now. Maybe it's, uh, uh, mm. it's maybe worthwhile giving a look at the tool. And for each communication trap in which we can fall, the tool suggests repair question. If you ask that question, boom, you jump into it. You, you, you create the opportunity to, to bring the conversation back to the facts. So for example, if I tell you, Jürgen, uh, we should definitely uh, uh, launch this new mobile application next year. And you would be absolutely correct to tell me, no, uh, we, I don't know what we're talking about. And, um, uh, we can't. Well, we can't is what is described on the tool as a limitation. So how do I bring back the conversation to first order reality? Uh, when you tell me we can't, I would probably reply, uh, and if we did, what would happen? Mm. Or I could ask another question like, uh, what would prevent us from doing this? All of a sudden, I'm putting the conversation on a clarity path because then you would start, to start giving me facts. So, well, first of all, your project is not defined. <laughs> I don't understand it. Mm. Uh, I don't know what's the purpose, what's the audience, and that's it. And now we're back to reality, okay? So. Um, that's what the fact finder does. I use that tool every day in my project management practice every day. That's mm. a tool I use every day. So, so you mentioned that it's a tool for self and, and yes. kind of, I could imagine you could use it for self-reflection as well. So how, how would you use it? Cause the example you gave is if, if say you and I were having a conversation, you, you suggested a course of action. I said, no, no, I don't think we can do that. And, and you then challenge, essentially you're challenging my assumption, which is a limitation um, on, on that proposal. But how would you apply it to yourself? 
<sighs> That's a great question. You can listen from uh, uh, my, 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 my little pause here. And it's an important question. Um, you know, to improve the quality of our inner dialogue, I don't know, but it's maybe a life quest. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> uh, and I must admit that these tools, um, especially the Fact Finder and another tool presented in the book uh, called the Nonviolent Request Guide, um, you know, um, can be applied to oneself. So, for example, uh, when I enter into a judgment, that's good, that's bad, do this, don't do that. Um, this is another trap described in the fact finder. Uh, I immediately ask myself before I speak, um, what makes you think that's bad? Mm. Why am I asking myself that question? Well, because that's bad, that's good, it's in my head. But if I identify the criteria that make me understand what's good, what's bad, and for what reason, then I'm, I'm because one, two, three, uh, then I'm coming again into first order reality. And when we are in first order reality, that's where we are the most effective to help others understand us. So, I apply these tools to myself, yes, a lot, uh, because they increase the level of clarity in which I express myself. <laughs> so I don't know if that answered your question. Uh, another yeah, power, does. Yeah. yeah, another powerful tool for that is, it's when, I guess, yeah, it's the last tool described in the book. It's called the Nonviolent Request Guide. You know, I'm Italian and I tend to be emotional. <laughs> so and, and 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 having grown up in a family that is very large and vocal <laughs> you know it doesn't work in every culture so um the nonviolent request guide is um uh, a tool that um i assembled to help me and then my colleagues and then other teams and other people manage conflict more effectively and the idea is when uh, we, we, we feel our, our, well, the framework, that tool comes from nonviolent communication from Marshall Rosenberg. What I did is a reduction and the simplification of it so that we, just like we, anyone can use it in, when emotions run high. And um, Marshall Rosenberg used to say, uh, anger is the expression of an unmet need. Mm. You know, if you work in delivery teams, <laughs> you know, I mean, when stakes are high and deadlines are short, <laughs> there is electricity in the air. So um, I had to find a way of uh, making that tension to deliver what we have to deliver expressed in, in a non judgmental way. And that last tool provides a list uh, it's, a, it's a way of expressing your feelings and expectations in an empathetic way and provides a checklist of feelings and needs where I believe many of us, unfortunately, are a bit illiterate. So when we have to describe our emotions or our needs, okay, we say we're happy, yeah, yeah. we're sad, but I mean, there are maybe 80 different uh, needs and 80 different uh, 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 feelings. So that tool in particular, to come back to your initial question, is like, can we apply them to ourselves? Uh, let's say I applied for a job position and my, my job was, I was not retained as a candidate. And, and you know, then you start thinking, oh, oh um, uh, you know, de depreciating mm. yourself. I'm not good enough. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Well, yeah. They, 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 I've not done enough. I mm. was not good. I, you know, you start questioning your real, your role, how whole life, and 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 that tool helped me in this very that very situation. For example, saying, "Hey, um, you applied. Now I'm using the tool. You 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 applied to that job. You didn't get it." Uh, you feel sad about that. 
your need now is to be secure, for example. So my request for myself is now learn what you have to learn from that interview. And it was an opportunity for learning and move on to the next one instead yeah. of judging my, myself. Okay. So that tool I use rarely. I use it when my emotions are high with other people, but I use it as well with me to coach myself. Yeah. One, one of the things I really love about that tool, though, is you do, you, you mentioned that, you know, there, there's such a range and depth of feelings and we tend to just use a few of those when, when we're articulating. Right. So we say, well, how are you today? I'm good. How, and then the next day, how are you today? Well, I'm not good today. You know, and it, it's almost black and white. <laughs> and yet, you know, one day I might be ecstatic. Another day I might be just melancholy um, rather, uh, as sad or I might be gloomy or I might be um, distraught. So there's or indifferent. Yes, yeah, so, so there's a whole range range of emotions and and you know if i say well i'm bad today it it could mean that right now i've um i've just got a um an itch in my eye like i had earlier when we started the conversation um, or it might mean that that i'm really sad over some event that's got me heartbroken it's it's kind of a whole range uncomfortable or and exactly, we have also yeah. the positive one. I feel joy, I feel enthusiastic, and so on. It works in both in both directions. And now, what the book presents is tools that bring this inner dialogue or collective conversations to a stage where we meet these two requirements of one, mutual understanding, and two, psychological safety or trust. These are huge yeah. requirements for teams to be effective. And the impact on the quality of the work, the atmosphere in the team, the ability to innovate in the team is just immense. Um, if the climate, you see, if, if we name, or, well, <laughs> when I want to say too many things, <laughs> sometimes I bug, as you can, as you, uh, you can understand, I am a passionate person. However, uh, this very notion, what the, the tools, why are they called high impact tools for teams? Because these tools work at the interaction level, in the small. And... Um, when in the small, every success is created piecemeal, as well as failure. So um, our body is a, a, a collection of cells. <laughs> so that, and then we emerge from the small. So does beautiful things in business. They emerge from the small. So what I try to do is uh, kind of create these mm -hmm. DNA level tools that work in the interaction level that improve mutual understanding and trust. And for that, we had to find ways to make it accessible for everybody to seek clarity, name emotions, and so on. Because again, the two big requirements are mutual understanding yeah. and trust. There are others, but these ones, in my opinion, were, as we discussed mm. a bit earlier, the elephant in the room. We just continue work without seeking mm. evidence for these two things. And then we know the project failure statistics. And for me, there is a direct correlation between the neglect of these two basic elements and the project failure rate and the statistics uh, mm. of teams. Yeah, and I love the metaphor of um, emerging from the small and, and focusing on the interactions and the transitions because you, you kind of related it back to cells and the key to life, isn't it, that things actually transfer through cell through the cell membrane from one place to another place which is actually the way most of the processes that keep us alive function yeah uh, absolutely and uh for that 
I believe um, we have to bring back <laughs> the human part of being working together as anthropologists, psych psychologists, uh, psycholinguistics have uh, described at the very core mm. of our management methods, which are great. However, it's not sufficient to say a leader must be a great communicator. Mm. That's not enough. Communication is not like just one process among 15, like procurement or marketing. No, communication is the process to put things in common that enables all the others. So when you're good at that, especially to me, these two requirements that are trust and, 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 uh, and or psychological safety, they're two cousin nation, notions and, and, and uh, uh, clarity, mutual clarity, then you start the magic happening. One, clarity has a direct impact on team efficiency, less execution problems, higher team efficiency because we don't have integration problems of my part and your part. And psychological safety, if you refer to all the work, beautiful work done by Amy Edmondson at Harvard, uh, has a mm. huge impact on innovation. Uh, I mean, in a climate, in a team where you, 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 you fear to speak up, uh, where there is fear in the air, um, or, or people working on different agendas for good reasons, well, we don't because we withhold information for fear of the consequences, we do not enable the flow of collective learning, sharing information with others, collective learning, collective intelligence, yeah. collective problem solving yeah. and innovation. So that's the direct impact of taking care of the everyday interactions hmm. on the big things we do. And guess what? When I'm asked to recover a troubled project, I never yeah. start with a high level audit. I just go in a meeting, I sit and I look, or if it's a meeting online, and, and I look at the way interactions are managed and uh, interactions are managed and um, the overall atmosphere in the room. And my diagnostic is very quick. And then we start from the micro mm. to enable the macro. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. With and, good results. And <laughs> There's something you said there, and I thought it's uh, it's like making management human again, <laughs> which is kind of part of my philosophy yes. of making marketing human again. But you know, anyway, again, yeah. come back to Peter Drucker. Uh, <laughs> I'm a Druckerian, okay, in my soul. Uh, and um, the book starts with a quote from Peter Drucker. Uh, management yeah. is about human beings. Its task is to make people capable mm. of joint performance. It is, yeah. What a lovely definition. I mean, yeah, it's beautiful. What do Perfect. you think? Yeah. I, when I, yeah, when I saw that, I it's thought, oh, this, I'm going to enjoy this book. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I'm just aware of the time. I want to uh, keep us both on track here. And um, before we move on to the buzz and our innovation round, I think it's probably a good point to uh, share with the listener how we can um, get a hold of the book, first of all, and also how can people find out more about you and your work apart from the book? So there's a lot of other work that you do uh, and, and get maybe even get in touch for a conversation. Uh, okay, so the book is available on most large online bookstores uh, from, uh, I remember the whole list, Amazon, Barnes & Nobles, and so high impact tools for teams. And if you want to find more resources uh, about uh, the book and what we do or get in touch with us, two URLs, uh, strategizer.com uh, and uh, my blog, uh, teamalignment.co. Teamalignment All right. And we'll, we'll have links, of course, in the show notes for that. So let's move on to the innovation round, the buzz, which is our, um, our round primarily to help the audience who are innovators and leaders in their field with some tips from your experience. So we've got five questions in this and hopefully you'll give us some really insightful answers that'll inspire the listener to go and do something awesome as a result today. So what's the number one thing anyone needs to do to be more innovative? 
persevere. Hmm. Persevere. Um, two things I would sure. say, if you allow me one second here. Um, one, at least if I deliver this some sort of innovation, um, one, I start, start from the problem and then continue because we all have plenty of ideas. Having ideas is, uh, is a feature of our brain. Now that does, you know, to make that happen and translate that into an innovation, there needs perseverance. Um, um, that book and these tools is a journey that started 20 years ago. So there, and, and, and in terms of the key principles, uh, you find in the book, um, I've been repeating many of these things, uh, in, 2005 already so now was that an innovation just to say that no but to transform this principle into a tool set and then testing that tool set of course uh, go out and test uh, uh, i refer to david bland's book here testing business idea a uh, super important topic but i really um yeah i would hmm. say perseverance yeah and and <laughs> Certainly. I mean, you, if you've got a strong belief in your idea and as you say, testing, testing it to see whether there's interest and whether it has traction with, with the right audience then, um, and then persevere to keep it going. Hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, the idea is to persevere <laughs> That's by <right>. adapting <laughs> to feedback. Huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and sticking right. yes, to yeah. your original <laughs> idea. No, 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 no. I mean, yeah, yeah. like, continue, continue, continue. Excellent. Yeah, All right. I mean. Thanks for the clarification. <laughs> um, now, what's the best thing you've done to develop new <laughs> ideas? I mean, you've you've probably answered that question throughout the conversation. Uh, I'll definitely mm. go out there and test. <laughs> Get out yeah. of the building, as Steve Brang and, and David. Blend repeat, yeah, because that, that, you know, after a while when you spend too much time with your own stuff and uh, you, you, I don't know, and I don't know about you, but I feel too, sometimes I yeah, enter into the inner world, inner, uh, hmm. inner world and then it's, it's kind of, it feel, you feel like it's genius and then you go out and, and, and really what, what helped me made progress uh in this work is to go out and test and and especially integrate the feedback from people all right that's work. great so in some ways it's that um taking that in a dialogue and testing it putting it through that uh, fact finder lens oh absolutely and you know i and, and i must present if any of the persons uh who contributed to this work is in the, in the book is listening all my apologies for having been so <laughs> insisting and boring repeating the same questions <laughs> you know uh, <laughs> what about this <laughs> and then you come back a few months later oh i have a new one can you give me your feedback and you know i, I really i really stress <laughs> some people out <laughs> for feedback <laughs> So uh, if I have this opportunity, <laughs> apologies. <laughs> yeah, all the time well, we lost um, together. I think, I think they'll all be pretty happy with the result, though. All right. Now, do you have a favorite resource you use most often? Um, yes, there are many. Uh, oh my God, mm -hmm. uh, this is a very large, large question. Yeah, uh, if I can give just two. Um, I'm a very fan of Alex Osterwalden and Yves Pignor tool. And one, one I use a lot, actually, it's the mm -hmm. value proposition canvas uh, to uh, especially the right side, um, um, which is, a, a, I think, a brilliantly uh, simplified mm -hmm. version of the empathy map. I use that tool a lot to put myself in, myself in the shoes of the audience, the client, and so on. This is one. And another tool I use a lot, it's uh, if you are familiar with uh, uh, agile tools, it's the retrospective. Uh, the retrospective is just a poster, three columns that I do at the end of every activity. Uh, what went well, <laughs> what went wrong, yeah, yeah. and what should we improve next time concretely. Um, it's, I think, a 
an incredibly powerful mechanism to uh, uh, boost team yeah. learning. I, I, yeah, these are. Yeah, I, I love both of those. Well, I, I'm a big fan of the empathy map. Um, we use that a lot in in our work in marketing, but the um, the retrospective is a great tool as well to kind of look look back but reflect on it from the point of view of what can we do better next time. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, and people get it immediately, no matter if you're a project manager or not. I mean, and, and that's what makes, in my opinion, also that. Yeah. Well, my next question is, what's the best way to keep a project on track? But I think you've already given us that in great detail using the uh, high impact tools. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to repeat yeah, yeah. myself. Yeah. Common ground, mutual clarity, mutual clarity. Mm. Just stay right. on the same page. And use <laughs> the high impact tools for teams to do that. <laughs> Okay, and what's what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? I wouldn't say be yourself because <laughs> you never, at least I don't know about you, but me, I mean, it's an endless journey. <laughs> I keep changing. So, however, if maybe I, think I can share my experience, it's uh, maybe we relate to point mm. one, it's to follow your passion. Uh, I believe if you feel some passion about something, just, yeah, that's a signal that there is something to explore that. And uh, it's very difficult to compete yeah. with a passionate person. That's definitely true. Uh, but what do you yeah. say to people that kind of say, well, I don't know what my passion is. Or how do I discover my passion? Uh, well. <laughs> it is a big one, isn't it? That's a big one. <laughs> Well, and I, uh, I'm not sure. Like, uh, I mean, if you don't well, know the answer, that's fine because I don't know. I don't know what yeah. the answer to that is, and and I know there's a. Well, you know what? Uh, what what I would do if you ask me the mm. question, I would use the fact finder, because I don't know my passion that's right. as a judgment. Mm. Um, uh, so I would say, or a limitation, uh, to be more precise. So I would use the fact finder and say, what mm. prevents you from knowing your passion? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we would start from there. I would start to understand what is blocking there, because I believe all of us, in some ways, have a passion somewhere. Mm. All right. Well, there's another great use of the fact finder tool. So interesting. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thanks again, Stefano. Now, do you have any parting advice for our listener today? Uh, well, uh, I hope that high impact tools for teams. Um, will help you concretely uh, have uh, better interactions at work and experience more successful projects if you are uh, in, into that field. Hmm. All right. And as I said earlier, we'll have links to the um, where you can get the book through Amazon, Barnes & Noble and the other, the other big online stores um, in the show notes. So finally then, Stefano, who else should I get on this show and why? Um, I would recommend Amy Edmondson, definitely. Yeah. For a discussion about the importance of trust and psychological safety on innovation in teams. Mm. Um, uh, again, bringing back the micro in the macro. All right. Well, um, you certainly referenced her work quite extensively throughout the book. So yeah, I'm fine. Great. Yeah. <laughs> And and uh, um, we'll see if we can get an introduction from you to Amy and reach out to her, see if we can get her on the show as well. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much for sharing your time and your insights with us so generously today on the Innova Buzz podcast, Stefano. I've really enjoyed this. There's been so much to explore, and I think we only touched on two of the two of the five tools. And um, but we we'll, we have to leave something for people to discover in the book, don't we? that's true <laughs> yeah yeah so that's all the, all the best for the future and and let's keep in touch thank you for having me and thank to all of our listeners thanks i hope you enjoyed that insightful and really informative conversation with stefano and took something away from his episode Stefano's tools are brilliant in their simplicity and powerful in the transformation that they enable. I encourage you to check each of them out on his website and see which 
can be of use to you. Now I'd love to know what you took away from Stefano's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post, which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash Stefano M. That is S-T-E-F-A-N-O-M. All lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Stefano M. You'll also find contact information there for getting in touch with Stefano, as well as links to the Team Alignment Co. website, the book High Impact Tools for Teams, Stefano's social media pages and the other resources we spoke about in our conversation today. Now, if you like this episode, please do share it with two other people that it might help so that we can get this wonderful information out to those people and tag me in that share so that I can reach out to you with a special thank you surprise. Stefano suggested that we have a conversation with Amy Edmondson, the author of The Fearless Organization and Big Team Training for Audacious Innovation on a future Innova Buzz podcast episode. So Amy, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast, courtesy of Stefano Mastro Giacomo. Tune in again to the next episodes of the Innova Buzz podcast. We've got yet more fantastic guests lined up, including Michelle Mazur of Communication Rebel and Profile and Communications Specialist Alan Stevens. Thanks for listening to this episode. Make sure you subscribe to the show to be reminded of new episodes. It's free to subscribe. Leave a review if you like even if you don't like me, I'm okay with that. I'm asking you to leave a review because it helps other people find this show. Go to innovabiz.co to join our marketing transformation community and access a free gift my team and I made for you. It's the Marketing Master Mini Class. We want to give you everything you need to transform your marketing into a human-centered, relationship-focused growth engine. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating.